call the uh, meeting of the Personnel and Animal Welfare Committee to order. Uh, it appears as if uh, it will only be myself, Paul Koretz, as chair. Um, so we won't have a quorum. Uh, anything we recommend will be a recommendation of the chair. And uh, I'm going to take item two, items two, three, and four on consent. And uh, uh, we'll begin with uh, item number one. Item one, Los Angeles Housing Community Development Department report relative to the request for the exemption of seven grant funded positions pursuant to Charter Section 101D4. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. I'm Laura Guglielmo, Executive Officer of the Housing and Community Investment Department, and to my left is Ab Ab Abigail Marquez, Assistant General Manager with the Housing and Community Investment Department. Um, the positions before you, there are seven positions in our community services. Uh, I always get it wrong, Abigail. Community <laughs> Services and Development Bureau. Um, these seven positions are 100% grant funded, and they support a number of programs within the Bureau, including the Domestic Violence Shelter Program, the Family Source Program, the Housing Opportunities for People with AIDS. Um, those are the three systems that they support. Um, these vacancies are vacant because of retirement, so we're seeking to fill these positions. These are critical positions for the department. And is human trafficking part of the domestic violence piece of it also? It is. It, it is, um, but that position is, there is a position um, that is currently filled and that's supported 100% by the general fund. Okay, and any of these positions require additional staffing or just exactly what you're asking for? At the moment, um, we our first goal is to fill the positions, and um, in the future, we may have additional staffing needs, but the current um, urgency is to fill these seven positions. And these positions are for a period of two years with a possible one-year extension. Uh, how do we guarantee continuity, and is that enough time for what these positions are targeted for? Can you these positions are primarily... Um, Six out of the seven positions are resolution authorities that are approved from year to year. Um, and it is largely based on the grant funds, which are not 100% guaranteed, although these grant funds have been consistently available for the last um, many, many years. Right. And we do anticipate that going forward. So that's the reason for that, um, that limitation. Generally, as long as the positions are filled, they are continued. It's just when they become vacant that we come back to you and request authority for the exemption under um, the civil service provisions to be able to fill these positions. So that's our uh, sort of ongoing process. Great. Well, thank you. And I will uh, recommend that we uh, move these forward. Great. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Next, number seven. Item 7, communication from the mayor relative to the exemption of one chief personnel analyst, class code 1741, for the personnel department pursuant to charter section 1001B. Good afternoon. Aram Kuyumjian, assistant general manager for the personnel department. Alma Guerrero, mayor's office. Um, we're here requesting um, the exemption of one chief, per chief personnel analyst for the personnel department. This position is currently funded in their budget, and it would be number 143 of the 150. And how is the uh, Equal Employment Opportunity Division previously managed without this position? It was actually a smaller division because uh, it predated the various authorities that, that council authorized for us. So the division has essentially doubled in the last couple of years. Uh, we only had a... Uh, senior PA2 uh, overseeing the division rather than a chief. Uh, and now that it has grown in number to an appreciable number, uh, one, we need a, a chief overseeing the division. But more importantly, the city is developing citywide uh, sexual harassment policies and revising the policies and procedures. And that has a strong legal component to it. So we really need someone with that specialized experience in addition to the personnel function in order to overse oversee that particular transition. And so nobody with that experience could be found through the civil service process? Not, not for this particular time, no. 
All right. Well, thank you. We'll approve the mayor's recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to number five. Item five, communication from the mayor relative to the exemption of one senior project coordinator, class code 1538, for the Department on Disability, pursuant to Charter Section 1001B. Good afternoon. Alma Guerrero, Mayor's Office. Um, we're here requesting an exemption for one senior project coordinator for the Department on Disability. This position is funded in their budget. And it is a new position, and this will be position number 147 of the 150. And uh, again, why could this not be done through the civil service process? Uh, good afternoon, sir. Stephen Simon, General Manager, Department on Disability. And Jaime Pacheco on my left, uh, Deputy Executive Director. Um, this position is essentially the director of our Community Outreach and Education Division and requires a rather extraordinary level of understanding of the disability community, both people with disabilities and all the service providers who serve them. Um, this does intake and referral. It gets people to the services they need. It supports our work in the Emergency Operations Center um, uh, during crises to make sure people get to the services and programs they need. Requires an extraordinary understanding of county public health systems and public benefit systems at the uh, state and uh, federal level, and we believe it does require an exempt position. All right, thank you. Uh, we will uh, approve the mayor's recommendation on this item as well. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Item number six. Item six, communication from the mayor relative to the exemption of one purchasing receiving inventory management accounts payable program manager, class code 1854 for the Department of General Services pursuant to charter section 1001B. Good afternoon. We're submitting a request for um, one exemption, a new exemption, for a PRIMA program manager for the Department of General Services. This position is funded in the budget this year and will be 150 of the 150 exemptions. And uh, why is the PRIMA program manager its own classification? Yes. It is a one-person classification. It was built specifically for um, the revamping of the, the supply services um, process within the Department of General Services. Danny, please identify yourself. Dan Yoshimura for Personnel Department on behalf of the Department of General Services. And uh, again, why could this not be... Uh found through civil service processes? Uh, I think the, the duties and responsibilities of this position are going to be unusual to the, the, the project that it's being um, applied to. This person is going to be involved in a review and reanalysis of the supply chain for the city and come up with improvements for making it more efficient. Okay. Thank you. And I believe we have one speaker from the public on this item, uh, Arnold Sachs. I'm number six, right? Yes. So, uh, yes, thank you. Good afternoon, Arnold Sachs. Um, although it's item number six, all the items, essentially, this is the personnel committee and personnel and animal welfare committee so I'm assuming that personnel would be part of the city's budget sometime down the highway uh, maybe next year something like that but yet none of these items have any financial impact statement attached to them and none of them have a community impact statement attached to them and yet you're consider every committee I just came from the uh, public work of the the Gang Works and Public Participation Reduction Committee, and they too, no financial impact statements on any of these, and no community input, uh, community impact, input impact. Um, so I'm wondering, 
Thank you, Mr. Sachs. Your time is up. Thank Not you. for wondering, it isn't. <laughs> you can continue to wonder. Oh, yeah. I know. No, I don't know. <laughs> and this item will be a put. Excuse me, you're disrupting the meeting. You can't keep talking out in the audience. This is your only warning. And so uh, we will approve the mayor's recommendation on this item. Thank you. Thank you. Item number eight. Item eight, Board of Public Works report in response to adopted budget recommendation relative to the status of succession planning, including the continuing rate of retirements in the Bureau of Engineering. Anna Lynn Rosio with the Bureau of Engineering. Welcome. Thank you. So uh, does the Bureau of Engineering have any method for attracting mid-career engineers to the city? Um, currently, because of the civil service process, our primary focus are for engineering associates, which is the entry level position. The citywide exam is open to all candidates, and that's done through the personnel department. The Bureau partners with the um, personnel department to do on-campus recruitment to target those that are in, um, currently receiving their degrees. And how, why is BOE the only department to do a report like this? Why you in particular? Um, we were just requested to report back. I can't um, speak for the other bureaus that also do recruitment. And, and how will uh, the 36% retirement to eligibility rate uh, affect the operations of the bureau in the next few years? Well, we are aggressively doing our recruitment to ensure that we are filling all of our vacancies through the um, entry-level positions. For promotional opportunities, we continue to have an aggressive um, mentorship program and training program to ensure that all of our employees are uh, um, able to move on and promote. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much. And. Uh, Mr. Sachs? Uh, yes, thank you very much again, Arnold Sachs. So if there's a 36% um, vacancy rate in, in your engineering department, uh, how does that affect the... Uh, the city's plans for a building um, infrastructure within the city. Uh, I mean, I know there's a lot of uh, bridge housing going on. You probably need uh, engineers for that. And there's a lot of underpass housing going on. You might need engineers for that. Uh, I understand there's also the Vision Zero plan that the city is uh, reconsidering. Uh, you need engineers for that. Um, does the Bureau of Engineers assist in all these different plans or that the city council manages to come up? You might even need an engineer to figure out what to do with the empty water bottles that you uh, passed this morning. Thank you, Mr. Sachs. And just for the record, no one ever said there was a 36% vacancy rate. Um, this item will, uh, and, and not asking for a response from the audience, um, we will note and file this uh, report and move on to item number nine. Item number nine, personnel department report relative to opportunities to expand the list of targeted local hire program classifications. Good afternoon. My name is Vince Cordero with the personnel department. I am pleased to share with you that the four new classifications were added to the TLH program back in September 2019. Those four cl classifications include the warehouse and tool room worker, street services worker, delivery driver, animal license canvasser. Over a two week period, TLH CAN is currently in the TLH pool. We're providing an opportunity to opt in to any of the four new classifications added. Uh, we received 1,127 candidates who opted in. Uh, departments also reported their current vacancies and anticipated vacancies over the next two years. There are currently 44 vacancies and 47 anticipated vacancies over the next two years in these four classifications. Uh, we recently received referral requests from Animal Services to fill eight animal license canvassers, canvassers and from street services for, to fill 19 uh, street services worker vacancies. Uh, the personnel department is committed to continuing to examine other classifications 
in order to determine whether or not the requirements and qualifica qualifications match the parameter of the TLH program. Thank you. Thank you. We're glad to see uh, additional categories added. Um, why does GSD have so many anticipated vacancies in, in the warehouse and tool room worker category? Um, GSD is here. I think they could speak to that. I personally don't. Dan Yoshimura, on behalf of the Department of General Services. There, well, the number of positions that we have available to us are people are going to other departments, and there are some retirements that are going on. So it, it's a combination of those. Yes. Those two. That's not typically the situation where there are these many vacancies. No. Usually, warehouse and tool room workers, when we get them, they develop them, they move on, but it's a much slower pace now. No. Hopefully, targeted local hire will help us fill in That's our quickly hope. in this category. Um, which of these classifications are the most popular among already existing candidates? In terms of our, the most popular was uh, street services worker. We had the most opt-ins. I don't have the number in front of me, but it was the most popular out of the, the four. Very good. Well, uh, thank you for the report, and we will... Uh, note and file that. Oh, actually, uh, Mr. Sachs, uh, you have a minute from this item as well. Yes, thank you again. I believe this is item number 10, right? Item uh, number 9. Number 9. Um, so, Targeted local hire program classifications. Um, how many more classifications are you planning on listing for the targeted local hire? You have uh, women, you have minorities, you have LGBT, uh, you have uh, African American, you have different nationalities, you have uh, Mexican, um, what exactly, because of all these different categories that you create, nothing ever really gets done, um, but it looks good. And again, no financial, fiscal impact statement submitted. If you're going to hire more people, won't that affect the general budget for the city? And uh, Thank you, Mr. Sachs. Your time is up. And uh, item number nine will be noted and filed. Item number ten. Item 10, Personnel Department Report response to motion, caress recording relative to reporting on hiring information and vacancy rates by departments on a quarterly basis during fiscal year 2019. Good afternoon, Council Members. My name is Vince Cordero with the Personnel Department. So back in July 2019, the Mayor's Office sent each department a mem memorandum of with uh, instructions and individual link to self-report their hiring slash vacancy rate information during the first quarter of fiscal year 1920. Uh, the first update was completed on July 30th, 2019, and monthly updates were requested until September 30th, 2019. 35 departments participated and submitted hiring and vacancy rate information specific to their departments. The self-report information requested included the following. Authorities and vacancy rates as of July 1st, 2019, and vacancy rates as of September 30th, 2019. Number two, hiring priorities as established by each department by order of position importance. Third, retirement and non-retirement attrition. And lastly, all declined job offers and the reason for the declination. Attached to the report is a summary chart of the vacancy rates as self-reported by, self by departments. While some departments report double-digit vacancy rate reductions, the information revealed an overall vacancy rate reduction of 2.36%. Uh, the decrease in vacancy rates was further accomplished by working with the personnel department to ensure eligible lists were requested and available to fill vacancies, and the TLH program was utilized wherever possible. The personnel department will continue to work with departments on collecting the data and report hiring information and vacancy rates by department on a quarterly basis to this committee. And thank you very much. And we also have representatives from the various departments here if you have questions about specific departments' information. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a few questions. Uh, the report suggests that uh, discharge probationary terminations were a more common reason than uh, taking a new job outside of the city. Uh, is that correct? And why is that such a high number? 
So that is correct. It was the third um, highest for non-retirement attrition. I'll have to report back on that. We didn't have, I don't have that data in front of me, but I'll have to report back on that specific information. But you are correct. It was higher than those. Yeah, if you could report back to my office, that would be great. Will do. Um, now, parking was cited as a reason for potential employees uh, declining job offers uh, in a high number. Um, does personnel have a breakdown of which locations uh, had a high number of declines based on parking? And um, what are we planning to do about that? Because I, I, I imagine there are areas where parking has been a problem for a lengthy period of time, and it's not cost effective for us to be uh, losing potential applicants over parking issues. I think we might have a representative. Uh, I'm Stephen Montagna, um, the Chief of the Benefits Division with the Personnel Department. So parking, um, the, the, the real issue here is, park, is, is parking capacity. Um, we have about currently about 2,400 uh, employees who, who are um, on various waiting lists trying, trying to get parking. Um, the way that our special parking MOU works is that there's a priority order for, for the assignment of parking. And uh, so um, re really at the bottom of that list is seniority parking. Um, and, and so we, we create waiting lists basically for people who are applying for parking benefits based, based on their seniority with the city. So what, what's, the, what's the parking MOU about? What's, what are the details of that? The special parking MOU, um, it, that's, um, um, uh, that, that, that was negotiated between the city um, and the unions and basically provides for um, what the parking rates are um, as well as uh, what, what the transit incentives are. And so basically the program was established to have parking revenues pay, pay, pay for the very the to, to, to pay for the transit incentives um, so when we administer parking um, we we have to follow the MOU and and um, but the the MOU is really not not the issue here in in the sense that the, the the fundamental problem is the lack of capacity so as an example for City Hall East we we, we have about a thousand people who are on the waiting list um, and there's there simply is is not the capacity to to, to accommodate them we do everything that we can to, to remove people promptly who um, are no longer eligible for parking so that we can issue new parking. Um, but, but there's, you know, with, with the hiring and sort of, you know, the larger workforce, um, uh, uh, there's the, we, we, we just have, have not been able to keep up with the capacity um, to be able to accommodate all those, those employees. So are we looking at geographic locations where we're having the most job refusals due to parking and trying to figure out whether we can find some land to build a parking structure, whether there's extra parking we can lease somewhere nearby. So, so we could work with um, Stevens Group to provide that information in terms of the data we received here for the declinations of which departments those were. So I think that might be helpful to Steven. Because if right. we can identify the areas where we're actually losing potential employees because of parking, I think we need to take a more aggressive direct approach than we have because I think there's some where this has been the case for for a number of years and we haven't really addressed it right and, and I, I think we, we we also would need to work with the CAO on that since you know at the uh, to 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 provide additional capacity for parking you know that's that's there's there's obviously going to be a financial impact for that right I think I'm going to suggest that we just hold this item on the desk and ask that you uh, report back uh, to the next meeting on this. So, thank you. Thank you. Just, just for the record, uh, since there is a question from the audience, which is not appropriate, and I'll give you your only warning on that, Mr. Herman, I will note we have no quorum because there are two missing members, so... This uh, will be reported as a communication from the chair. And technically, we're not required to take any testimony because uh, 
you'll have an opportunity to uh, speak to these items at council, but I am taking public comment anyway. Uh, item number 11. Item 11, motion corrects Bloomfield Lesson relative to amending Los Angeles Administrative Code to change the language in regard to animal sterilization or related matters. And I'd just like to ask if you could comment on the motion. But. Tammy Watson for the Department of Animal Services. Um, we did look at the motion, and the department is in full agreement with the motion. Um, as stated in the motion with the draft EIR, once if and when it's approved, we do anticipate 20,000 additional free roaming cats that will need ster sterilization. So it is important that the language is changed to include um, animals rather than pets. And so the department is in full support of this motion. Thank you. And uh, give me a second here to adjust my screen. I don't know who the speakers are. Now I do. Um, we have some speakers from the general public on this subject. Uh, Diana Mendoza to be followed by Daniel Gus and Arnold Sachs. Welcome. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, Diana Mendoza from PETA. So every year the department is asking the Budget and Finance Committee for more funds for spay-neuter. Uh, there actually hasn't been any reports in the commission meetings about the finances for all of 2019, but I can tell you that in 2018, John Forland and, um, I, I'm so sorry, I forget her name, the woman in accounting at Animal Services, they expressed serious concern about having enough funds to even cover the amount of spay and neuters that the mobile clinics that the department is contracted with were filling. Um, and that was before that any rabbits were added to the mandatory spay neuter ordinance. So... Um, the Animal Sterilization Fund, as you know, is, offers assistance to low-income individuals and people who want to do the right thing, which is get their animals fixed. So we are asking to get a uh, commitment from Budget and Finance Committee to cover these 20,000 additional spay-neuters every year, or better yet, set up a, a separate fund so that we're not taking away resources from the people who need help the most. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Daniel. Gus. Hi there, uh, Daniel Gus. Uh, I give away uh, 250 to 300 free spay neuters a year. If I had enough money, I could do double. I could do triple. There is no limit to how many spay neuters my charity could do each year. This is a long overdue measure. I am beyond happy to hear about this because the problem is less individuals, dogs and cats and other animals, but all of the ones out there who don't have people to to get them done. I, I, I could do a thousand free spay neuters a year. Uh, the question is, and I like uh, clear, will, the, will, will I be able to access the funds because I'm out there with the colonies and the hoarders and some really awful situations. So this is a wonderful, I'm, I wish Brenda was here so she could hear me cheering this thing. I wish the commissioners were here so they could hear me cheering this desperately. Of all the things, I think this is so in, beyond overdue, uh, full-throated support, but fund it. Thank you. Thank you. Right? I'll tell it. I was going to say, I'll take it back with the full enthusiasm. To all six of them. Uh, Arnold Sachs to be followed by Wayne Spindler and Mr. Herman. So Arnold's not here. Mr. Spindler. Yes. So again... I mean, the harshest critic ever is actually saying you did something right. I can't believe it. But I know, I know you're going to blindside us somehow. I can look at that greasy little Jewish face of yours and I can see the devil behind those eyes, yes. I know little animal sterilization is your goal. But I know that every cat dog out there, they just want to make more puppies and kittens. And that's what you want to stop. And there's too many in the shelters. So are you going to give the money where the money belongs? No. And so, of course, my amending motion, and thank you for this, Brenda Barnett, the first animal we're going to have sterilized is no Martina so she can have no more puppies. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Spindler. Mr. Herman. 
So you see the good example of Peter and Daniel Gus of City Watch. A good example. Spay and noodle sterilization. Yet the city of Los Angeles discriminates over $20,000 to provide for serious funding. Where is the serious monies? You keep stealing from disabled people. You keep stealing from my baby, a PSD. Give Daniel Gus a voucher for $100,000 and get this process rolling. Give the lady speaker just, just regarding... One, hold, hold this time. Do me a favor and take the dog down. I'm afraid he's going to fall off the counter there. I don't want you to hurt your animal. Thank you, sir. Well, one is, this dog is very special. She is not ignorant, belligerent, or a fool. She's been trained by a professional, Armando Herman. So when you fuck with my $50,000 dog, ever, ever, you will know you fucked up. Thank you. And so we will uh, approve this motion and move it on to council. Item number 12. Item 12, motion of Olympia Louisiana Relative Constructing the Bureau of Sanitation in consultation with the Department of Animal Services to prepare a policy that provides for microchip scanning and notification of registered owners when picking up a dead animal. Welcome. Welcome. I'm Daniel McKay, Bureau of Sanitation. Karen Nipshire, Department of Animal Services. Ron Lee, Bureau of Sanitation. Blanca Calderon, LA Sanitation. I wonder if you could briefly walk us through this motion. Well, the motion stated uh, it wanted a clarification on the procedure for collecting dead animals and the chipping process. And uh, our, our operators, uh, if they locate a dead animal, they do scan for a chip. And if they find a chip, they contact the company that we're contracted with that um, harnesses the chips and gives out the information of the owners. So at that point, they discuss whether or not um, the, our driver is going to contact the resident or the company will contact them. One of them will contact them and tell them they retrieve your animal. And then they would have the option to pick up the animal at the shelter uh, once the driver dropped it off there. Very good. Um, I don't have any other questions, but I have a few speakers. So, thank you. All right, thank you. And the speakers will be Daniel Gus, Arnold Sachs, Wayne Spindler, and Mr. Herman as well. Well, hell's, uh, Daniel Gus, hell's freezing over today because this is another great idea. Um, I didn't see in the write-up that uh, they're going to drop the bodies to, um, to the shelter. That was my concern, that you give people... 24, 48, 72 hours to decide if they want to have the body cremated or they want to do a paw print. Um, very often there are people whose pets have been lost and they were picked up by other people and they could have been missing the animal for years. So it's very important that, that they be given a chance to pick up the animal uh, and dispose of it or, 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 or get the ashes. One thing that does concern me about the, micro, uh, about the scanner though is that not all scanners are the same. I'm not an expert on it. Some scanners are universal scanners. Some have less than great records of scanning for all chips. I would suggest uh, speaking with uh, Found Animals Foundation or the other people who are experts in, in the universal scanners, because some scanners are, uh, are better than others. That's all. But it's a great idea. Thank you. Thank you. And that's a reasonable idea to, to forward to animal services. So I appreciate it if you look into that. Mr. Spindler? Yeah, so I got my two pets, my two bitches, Monica and Nuri, my two little bitches. So I had them microchipped, and they're in my backyard. Yeah, they're in my backyard, my, my, you, two, my two puppies. So, you, you know, know, you don't have animals. Well, the, yeah, it's about the topic. two puppies that I have microchipped, so in case they get out and they're found on the road, they can be notified. That's all I'm saying, my two bitches. So I 
would recommend strongly that this program be expanded citywide. That everybody who's got their bitch get their bitch microchipped immediately so that you can find out where they've been. I want tracking devices on these chips so that I can just simply go home and scan my bitch and find out where she's been, where she's taking my card, where she's taking my credit card with them boyfriends. Thank, Thank you. you so Thank much. You. Mr. Herman. Well, as you see, I have multiple bitches, one in my arm now. And this bitch is a fine bitch, but I should hope not to see her um, being picked up for being dead because the city of Los Angeles is spreading disease by not cleaning our, our, our streets and making them safe, not just for pedestrian friendly, but for service animals. And the day my animal will be get sick from a dead rat, or your poisoning of washing the streets with poisons as Mike Fuhr's office has been known to wash urine and feces into the sidewalk and streets, I will bring a claim against the city for the record. How dare you? How dare you? Besides that, my dog has a microchip. You ought to put two microchips on those two fat cunt bitches in City Hall that disrupt our meetings. Nuri and Monica, the cunts of I, I City think, Hall, Los Angeles. you're off top. No, 200 list. Spring Street, City Hall, room 340. Fuck you, 42 USC, 1983. Thank you, Mr. Her Mr. Herman. And uh, we will approve this motion. Moving on to council. What else do we have before us, if anything? Mr. Goss, you have a minute for a general public comment, if you so desire. I now back to the normal stuff. Uh, council members, or councilmen, um, I, I think I've cracked the issue of, of your breeder uh, problem and the, and the public records and licensing. The city's missing out on thousands of dollars worth of revenue every year, and I'll take it offline with your office. Uh, and I'll, I'll deal with that separately. Um, I'm in possession of internal records that show that employees feel that Councilmember Weezar is a sexual predator. And I have it in writing. And I have that the city was warned about it. And I've reached out four times now to personnel just to find out what has been done since the city was warned about this. And the city is not providing any information about what it's doing to protect women who work in his office or employees who might be subject to other types of sexual harassment. Since the Department of Personnel is not responding, I'm going to publish this, but it really looks bad on the city when they don't cooperate and provide information. If you care to speak offline, let me know. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we also have two other speakers, Mr. Spindler and Mr. Herman. Is right. So now, so you heard the bad news. Now, why is it all happening, niggas? And why am I here? Because I'm a nigger. And so now I know Is there any topic can, that relates to yeah, any of the Yeah, I did with my time back on the car. Now, I got to develop my mentality with only 60 seconds with a fourth grade education. Now, you know that now they got the email showing Mr. Hootsie Tootsie Jose Weeza is a sexual predator and a thief. And we know that it can be proven that other city employees were covering up the whole time. So if you're female out there and you're listening to this right now, get to the phones and call the local hiring attorney and sue the city for sexual harassment as a pattern of practice and sue Parker Rhodes personally because he covered the whole thing up. He's a rapist, a sexist Thank you. too. Time is up. Thank you. So because Daniel Gus is a writer for City Watch, for the record, is Jose Weezer a sexual predator? He did so with Francine Godoy for $176,000 of taxpayers' money that I paid for. I want that return, FBI. 
And why is the FBI not getting Jose Weezer out of console? Today is the anniversary of the FBI probe into City Hall, Jose Weezer and his fat cunt wife, who were money laundering as Salesian Bishop Amat, fuck the Catholic Church, and fuck anyone who believes that the Catholic Church has done you any good. Go to prison. And FBI, if you're listening, subpoena Paul Fat Coretz and his fucking family and find out why he's allowing the predator, sexual harasser, Jose Weizar, to lie. All right, I think that ends general public comment. Uh, no other items before us. We are adjourned.